Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here, and um, it's uh, it's an honor to be on a panel with these two amazing writers and poets whose work I've admired for a long time. Um, and I'll start with a poem from my book. I am a little bit breathless because I come from sea level, so <laughs> I may be more slowly than usual. So my book is called Bountiful Instructions for Enlightenment. You should go get it if you want enlightenment. Um, <laughs> Abode. In the house of love, save the best room for rage. Give it the softest, warmest blankets, sweet, endless light of the plains, and a stack of dishes to break. Tell it to make itself at home. It will, anyway, let rage roam through the dungeons where compassion is wrestling suffering into chains. Let it mess up the kitchen where joy is whipping up confections and spaghettis for all beings. Let it piss in the pots that equanimity and generosity disinfect daily on their knees. Let it whirl through the study, ruffling the rondos that loving kindness composes each dawn. Notice me, it wails. Notice where rage tells the truth and when it lies. Honor it like a divine guest or your beloved soft-hearted child, the one who will not let you rest until you have made room in your house for one more stray cat one more bastard child or thought, unwanted, with nowhere to take refuge. Um, thank you. So we thought we would each uh, just share a little bit of poetry and then some thoughts on uh, poetry. And I don't know, the, the description for this session was very grand. It was like the philosophy, politics, and inspiration, and metaphysics, I don't know, of poetry. Um, but I thought that I would talk about this moment um, when I think so many of us feel these daily injections of rage and what to do about them. Um, and one of the things that my own Buddhist practice has helped me with is to expand the, the love, the love part um, and make it able to be big enough to hold the rage. Um, so I'm thinking of this a lot on this day when, mm, you know, the revolution is happening in St. Louis and elsewhere in our country. And uh, as we're here on Arapaho land, and I'm thinking also of the connection, the deep connection that many people are naming between the very roots and foundations of our country, our democracy, in genocide and in uh, African American uh, slavery, enslavement, and also in India, where I've lived for the last six years, um, in our Dalit communities, in the way that we have treated in India, our tribal communities, and the necessity of staying in touch with our rage about that, with our grief and our rage, um, for me that's a deep root of poetry and the whole uh, enterprise about poetry is, about, is of connecting to our intimate moments and the intimacy of the grief, the rage, and the shame that we feel and ought to feel and not to run away from that not to uh, give ourselves over to distraction and the world of clicking and liking and you know all of that <laughs> following, um, but to really follow the lead of something internal and something also external in a much broader sense in the spiritual uh, and in the sense of being grounded in the land and in the universe that with all of its with all of the histories of the lands that we live on. So that's my few words. 
Thank you, that was nice. And I'm glad you mentioned the uh, Rappo lands, um, uh, Rappo, Cheyenne, and other peoples who were through here. I'm, I'm not gonna say much about poetics because uh, I wanna read some rough new poems that uh, talked a lot about poetry anyhow. This is a sequence of poems that I've worked on for two books, um, working often with the bioregion and as a way of getting deeper into the bioregion, a uh, certain amount of the Arapaho language, which turns out to be a very difficult language because it's so different from Indo-European languages. Um, this is called Tenth Song of the Meadowlark, and I set myself a couple of riddles to work with. Um, some of them, ones that everybody works with. Death, love, but one particular one was the great um, naturalist Peter Warshaw had once said in a lecture, a watershed moves like a raga. Not like a symphony, it moves like a raga. And so in these poems, I'm gonna be sort of interrogating that statement a little bit. Tenth Song of the Meadowlark. Thirteen notebooks have passed since I worked at this poem. A friend long dead called the poem an archetype. What did he mean? Many tracks lead through is one thought. It has portals and byways another. Now Jack Column has gone straight through. Out west there's talk of land of the dead. Which trail? Where next, dear compadre? The tenth song of the meadowlark, a user's manual for the bioregion. Each river drainage moves like a raga to begin as birds slowly at dawn, scattered here and there notes. Some passerins learn the wrong song. Imitation is often imperfect. Tilting my head to listen, sleep blue lidi lidi juvi. Western male meadowlark, his yellow tuxedo vest, he sings only nine songs. Hence, I call this one the tenth. That black bib, that yellow breast, that tattoo, it's a star from years in the Air Force. I'd take that if I could to remember you by. You've always carried it? Protection, yes, but in what ways do you need protection? It could be for eating. Swap it for sandwiches, then beat your chevron wings up 4th of July Valley. Some cultures see us reincarnate as birds. She talked about spearheads. At Caribou Lake, they had no notches. That's the Folsom style. Wood, sinew, leather, many plant fibers if you know how to harvest them. Well, quiver goes back to a Mongol word. Beads, do you know how hard it is to make a bead? Have you ever made a bead? There is a white bed of clay. You will not ever find it. You wrote a poem near it once. You used the word communist, a word falling from use. Canyon of the ancients, will you show me the map? One question, where does a book begin? Does it begin the last 1,000 years? Page paper, parchment, sheep's hide, palm leaf, bamboo. It changes what you think of the petroglyph to see frog as a clan sign. Horn figure pecked into desert varnish. It was cold the night Jack Collum died. We had a dream. We were chipping acrostics into rock. In his visions, he's composing acrostics. The dying enter a sphere of visions. This is a no-shooting zone. The binding is Japanese, sewn. He inscribes it for me in running grass script. Black ink jotting left to right. Unseen electric currents. Grief preys on the living but not the dead, I hear. Footfall, Darjeeling, flute, blade, sunlight, day. Can you give your name away? That's from a friend, a poet whose name I withhold. We all might have been going to have lived a long, long time ahead, but on this continent, outlaws and anarchists by the fire. 
Listen to Kishori Amankar sing the rain season song. She regulates the monsoons. Here, the southern Rockies, skirts of rain go trailing down valley. Yes, but how does Raga recharge the seasons, river drainages, the watches of day and night, the prahars? Why toady at daybreak, Malcolm's at midnight? Terry Riley said he could pass thoughts along. Pandit Pranath gave him some insight. Vidya Rao told me she'd consider the question. Then an old college comrade had a story of lessons in Oakland. A telephone line passed the window. When Pranath sang, sparrows and warblers perched facing the room. When my friend sang, they flew off. <laughs> I always hoped to write you a song. Sad little crack thing, other birds fly off, the magpies get raucous. Trash birds, you call them. Song with no beginning, you never had no beginning neither. Just pieces. The refrain changes, words fall away. One note I found in the Perseid medicine belt. Meteor is all over sugar loaf. That wild oregano's purple thistle. You drop your clothes on the tiles. Ballet shoes down the stairs. They lie there, twisted, like four clocks set to different times. A condor burial in Larkspur. Bones of a hundred grizzly and black bear. Sea otter bones. A California village that dates back to the pyramids. Tools, musical instruments, harpoon tips, spears. The ceremonial burial, paint on the condor's wing feathers. Nobody's heard of it in California. Today is total solar eclipse, 1145. Smoky and cool. Clark's nutcracker going west released a loud grok. Small birds perch unalarmed. Flutes, bone awls, hairpins, game pieces. What raga to sing when the sun goes into eclipse? The holy shit raga. <laughs> Day moves to dawn to dusk and back. <laughs> Thank you both. That was lovely. And thank you all for being here. I'm so glad to be here, a part of JLF. Um, and all the dinging, whatever it is. <laughs> Keeping us awake. Um, I didn't prepare remarks in particular, but I prepared a poem, or I have a poem that I prepared. But I guess I would say that um, I'm glad Meenal brought up this um, invoking the way that poetry connects us to our rage and to the present. And I also want to say that it, for me, it's a place um, that, uh, where I can seek refuge. So not all, that I, where I can seek refuge from the way that everything is disconnected. It, the poem for me arises in this place that's, um, it's not the place of the, of the everyday world, but it's a place where everything is connected and everything even in, in the everyday world is connected. Um, so all those things that, I mean, and the poem must reflect also all the jaggedness and pain of the everyday world. But I guess in particular, I had just finished um, this, this book that has a whole section on um, animals that have gone extinct in modern times and I was in the pain of that quite a bit. And I wanted to be in the joy of the poem too. And I was on a, a residency in California. It was a residency devoted to artists who dip into the sciences and scientists who dip into the arts. And I would take walks every day with a cognitive scientist who was amazing. She um, did a lot of work on baboons and she was really into, there were all these banana slugs on the trails and she would sit, she would lie down on the ground and watch banana slugs mate for two hours. <laughs> and so, I, it, she just inspired me to think about how I look and how I pay attention to the world. And one day when I was walking on one of the paths, I saw a salamander, um, which is an animal I grew up with in California. 
Um, I don't know how many people have seen a salamander out in the wild, but they're just this bright flame of life. They are so alive in their color and their, in their movement. They're, they're uh, magical. And I watched it lumber over this log and I remembered that the reason we have shoulders and hips is because of amphibians doing this work, inventing these things. And so I just started to think about all the work that other animals did that we benefit from. And so I began this poem that uh, pays homage to all that work that's been done and, and revels in it and takes refuge from the Anthropocene by thinking about everything we're carrying around that has been carried around for centuries and centuries and centuries before humans. Uh, and you know we, know we know now because the angel fish has, or the zebra fish has been sequenced, its genome, we, we share 70% of our genome with, with the zebra fish. That's how connected we are to everything. So I'm gonna read a little bit from this poem called Your Kingdom, which is a 40 page poem and I will not read all of it. <laughs> I'll find some place to stop. Um, what, what time does your watch say, Andrew? Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, so just start snapping when it's time to stop if you go. Just stop mid-poem. Your kingdom. If you like, let the body feel all its own evolution inside. Opening flagella and feathers and fingers door by door a ragged neuron dangling like a participle to hear a bare sound. Red eye-hole rabbit, fat of the bulbous stalk pecked out to the core so you can bore back to the salamander you once were, straggling under the skin. Grope toward the protozoa, snagging on the rise toward placental knowing. Who developed eyes for you, agape in open waters? The worm that made a kidney-like chamber burrows in, directing your heart leftward in nodal cascade. Slow at your hagfish spine, who will bury your bones? Investigate a redwood rain or tap the garnet of your heartwood, bark. Put your flat needles on dry ice to inquire after your tree family, father or mother in the fairy ring next to you, find you are most closely related to grass, your hexaploid breathing pores gently closing at night. When did you begin your coexistence with flowering plants from which arose the bee before the African honey badger, but after the dark protoplanetary disk of dust grains surrounding the sun become the earth? You had no nouns, did you? Feel the gravitational sorting in the pre-lung graphite as it marked toward tissue? The split in prokaryotes when ether lipids did you no good, but still you learned to unleash energy, breaking, making bonds, and house some ancient groping grains in your gut, foraging on gases, and who knows what phototrophic algae, karate chopping water splitting to feed on sunlight, and thus you can eat an apple after bacon, benefiting from the invention of glucose storage. But the rugged sex life of the banana slug, nipping at its partner's penis in liquid crystal slime, has little to do with you. Yet you can watch it and wonder at the structure of your own snot's likeness to its body fluids. Now that you have learned to traffic phonemes plus genes in their own bio chassis delivery system, glottal stop in your city or button made possible by obstructed airflow, when your organs made for eating, breathing, began to cry out, the tongue in torsion to express your thought, and it was strange how you alter your formant frequencies, and I becomes a you. Around the fire, you switch to pure sound in the dark, and I know what you mean.
about three minutes for questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, they say poetry is an agent of change. Do you guys believe that uh, when you write poems, do you, uh, do you, are you trying to induce a change in the society? Uh, could everybody hear? The, the, the question is, uh, would they say that poetry is an agent of change? Do we try to invite change when we're writing poetry? Yes. Thinking of yes. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although famously, of course, um, there's the quote, poetry make, makes nothing happen. Um, but, you know, that's very interesting to meditate because making nothing happen is very powerful. <laughs> nothing is a very powerful concept and idea. So, and, you know, e the zero, everything is made possible by the notion of the zero in, say, computers. So thinking about what it means to make nothing happen. Um, and I think that's a very important thing to meditate on right now. Yeah, I was going to say no. <laughs> but I think there's, you know, I think like any of the arts, there's an incredible interchange between conscious desire or conscious intent and unconscious impulse. And I think, you know, one of the joys of sitting down to write poetry, and I assume for musicians and artists of all sorts, you really don't know what's going to happen. Something changes, but it seems the more you try to make something happen in a particular way, the more you, you know, actually make the poem wooden and a sort of instrument of rhetoric rather than uh, expression of passion or feelings. Yeah, uh, actually, and, but I want to say too, there's all, the notion that the poem transforms the, the, the writer, any writing transforms the writer, and that is something happening too. Yes, and also I don't think anything needs to make change happen. Change is happening. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, maybe there's a way to nudge change in one direction or another, but really the changes that are happening are so huge and all of us are just a little little bit of it, and a poem is also a little bit of it. Um, and sometimes I, I wonder if, you know, the change that's happening, really what we can do is decide which side of it we're on, you know? Like be right with history, be right with the planet, um, be right with the people that we love and that we wanna be in solidarity with. That's, that's what we can do. Um, I, don't, I don't know that any one of us should have the hubris to think that the change rests with me or with my, you know, verse or something. Since I'm holding it, I'll just say, I, I think every poem does change me, and I'm feeling uh, really emotional to be in Boulder, actually, right now, because my, uh, my father died a few months ago, and this was the first place in America that he came. So he, in 1963, he came to do his master's degree here. And so, um, you know, I've written, over the last year, I've written a lot of grief poems about his passing and about the complications of our relationship, which was not always easy. Um, but the poems, writing the poems during that period, it's like they open a door, right, into time travel, into my understanding of the entire past of our relationship and maybe the past before that, of his life before that. So, like one of the lines that I found myself writing in this kind of haze of intense emotion was, he was my wound, so I became his. And so if that line, I still don't know really what it means, but I think for me, the most interesting things that happen in writing poetry, they become these lines that are kind of like koans, and then they just keep sort of sitting and filling the space. I think it's sort of a mysterious thing, but um, I translate also from the Sanskrit, and one of the um, poems that I have just held my heart for a very long time is by uh, 
literary critic named Vishwanath, but he wrote a um, book called the Sahitya Darpana, and he opens with an invocation stanza, Sharad Indu Sundara Ruchish Chetasi Sa Me Giram Devi, that goes something like, um, bright as the moon's light in autumn, goddess language, having stripped from my heart the endless woven darkness, may she cast the nature of all things into light. And I just love that as a sort of prayer, that language itself, or the goddess language, or our poetry, can remove the darkness from our hearts and actually illuminate the meaning of things around us. And this flies right in the face of postmodernism, which tends to be very skeptical about the power of language, prison house language, and all that. So. I think we're getting the signal, and that's a beautiful place to end. Yeah. yeah.